We are in the middle of the book of Exodus. The book begins, Jewish people are in Egypt. They are enslaved. They spend many, many hundreds of years there. And then they have the redemption. They have the Exodus. We meet Moses, and he has all the negotiations, first with God, then with Jewish people, and then with Pharaoh, with the ten plagues. We read about the, you know, the, the seven plagues we read last week. This week we're reading about the three final plagues and all the myths that come with it. We're going to have a very momentous Exodus. We're going to read about the manna and then, then the water coming out of the rock. A lot of very interesting stories that are upcoming. And finally, the Jewish nation gets to Sinai. Fifty days after the Exodus, they arrive at the mountain and they're ready for the Torah. They get this amazing revelation. They get the Ten Commandments. They get prophecy. And then Moses transitions to the next world, so to speak, to get the actual bulk of the Torah, really to get everything as we mentioned in the past. What does the nation do? They're waiting. They're waiting 40 days. And when Moshe comes back, it's not exactly a happy uh, reunion because the nation, or at least a small part of the nation, decides to do the golden calf, which sounds a lot like idolatry. I don't want to get into that discussion, but it, it's definitely you know, smacks of idolatry. And then Moshe has to take the two tablets and crush him and try to stop the bleeding. One of the most perplexing stories is, you know, how is it possible a nation experiences so much witnesses, so many miracles, splitting of the sea, the ten plagues, ten commandments that sign a prophecy and devolve so quickly, 40 days later, to do the sin of the golden calf. That's one of the most central questions in Exodus. And then we find a very bizarre teaching in the Midrash. The Midrash brought down in Shemos Rabbah uh, chapter 42, item number 7. The Midrash quotes the verse in the beginning of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy begins, these are the words that Moshe spoke to the children of Israel, and it gives us the location, or seemingly the location of this message. It's on the other side of the Jordan. It's in the Midrash, in the desert. It's in the plains. It is opposite Suf. It is between Paran and Tophel and other places, Lavan, Chatzorot, and Dizahav. So you look at Rashi, it's a very complicated verse to unpack. Rashi explains what is actually the messages of that, of that first verse of Deuteronomy. The second verse says, it continues apparently to identify the coordinates of this location. Eleven days from Chorev, through the way of Mount Seir, until a place called Kadesh Barnea. Eleven days from Chorev, eleven days from Sinai. What is going on over here? So it's very, very long teachings of the Talmud, of the Midrash, and the Rashi. One of the teachings of the Midrash is as follows. What does it mean 11 days from Chorev, 11 days from Sinai, says the Midrash. Over the course of 40 days after Sinai, for 29 days, the nation was with God. And for 11 days, they were contemplating how to make the golden calf. Moses is not there for 40 days. 29 days, the people held strong. 11 days, they were plotting, they were scheming, they were contemplating how to do the golden calf. Very unusual. Like the, the question of how they did the golden calf is a very difficult thing to grapple with. And then we have this very bizarre midrash. Well, it wasn't just a isolated sin. There was 11 days of contemplation, of scheming, of planning for this sin. What exactly does it mean that the nation was contemplating the golden calf for 11 days? Question number one. Question number two, maybe also one of the central questions of the Exodus narrative, is the question of the duration of the Egyptian exile. How long was the nation suffering being enslaved in Egypt? In this week's partial, we read chapter 12, verse 40. Umosha ben Yisrael, Asher Yashu Mitzrayim, the duration of the time that the nation dwelled in Egypt, Shloshim Shana, Barabah Meyes Shana, was 30 and 400 years, 430 years. If I ask the question, how long was the nation enslaved in Egypt? Apparently, we have a scintillatingly clear answer, 430 years. Amazing. If this is the only verse that you saw, your life will be very simple. The problem is, is that there's a lot more verses to read. Go back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. This is what's called the chapter, this is the covenant of the parts. The chapter begins, Abraham is promised by God, you'll have a family, you'll have a legacy, you'll have a nation, you have the land of Israel. Abraham asks, well, how do I know that I will inherit it? And God says, take all these animals, cut them halfway, 
some animals are cut, some animals don't cut, and we're going to make this covenant. And part of the covenant is that Abraham is given a prophecy that he should surely know. This is chapter 15, verse 13 of Genesis. You should know for sure that your descendants will be foreigners in a land that they don't own, and they will be enslaved, and they will be oppressed for 400 years. And then when they leave, the nation that is going to host them is going to be judged, and they will leave with great wealth. So here we're given a, a, a prophecy, a forward-looking prophecy about the Egyptian experience. Abraham's told they're going to be, they're going to be enslaved, they're going to be foreigners, they're going to be oppressed for 400 years, and then they're going to leave with great wealth. So this is a fulfillment, apparently, of the Egyptian experience. 400 years, they're going to suffer, and they're going to be aliens, and they're going to be enslaved, and they're going to be tormented. So three different components of this suffering. And that's going to be for 400 years. And they're going to leave. And the nation that's going to host them is going to be judged. And then they're going to leave with great wealth. So you have a different number. If you read this is the only verse that you read, you would say, well, the people were suffering for 400 years, not for 430 years. So which is? Is it 400? Is it 430? So if you look at Rashi, and Rashi in both places in Genesis chapter 15 and in Exodus chapter 12 addresses this question, and he is able to parse them out. That's what we need Rashi for. He says, well, for 430 years, they were in a land that wasn't theirs. That doesn't say specifically land of Egypt. It says they're going to be in a land that's not theirs. In total, it's going to be 430 years. And that is from the point when God promises Abraham in the covenant of the parts that they're going to be wanderers, they're going to be suffering because they're not going to be in their homeland. That starts at that point. Abraham is 70 years old. 30 years later, Isaac is born. 400 years later, the Exodus happens. So the whole total of, of, of this experience is going to be 430 years, but only 400 of them are going to be Abraham and his descendants because Abraham's descendants, the, the one that matters is Isaac is born 30 years later. And therefore, Abraham and Isaac are going to be foreigners Abraham's going to start the process of being foreigners because he doesn't yet quite own the land of Canaan. He's going to be even a foreigner in his homeland. And that's going to be for the course of 430 years. But the descendants, that part of it is only going to be for 400 years. And that begins with the birth of Isaac. Well, how long was the nation actually in Egypt? That's not 430 years. That's not 400 years. That's only 210 years. And Rashi even points out that they were in Egypt for 210 years, which equals the numerical value of the gematria of the word redu. And he's invoking the verse in Genesis 42.2, where Jacob tells his children to go down to Egypt, descend to Egypt, and go procure food so we can make it through the, the, the famine. He tells them, I heard that there's food in Egypt. Redu shama, descend there. The numer- numerical value of the word redu is 210. And therefore, we have another date, 430, 400, 210, 430 is in general, beginning with Abraham. 400 is, is already when his descendants kick in. And 210 is the actual month of times the nation was in Egypt. Very clear, very simple, no problems. Well, actually not so. You open up the first verse in Parsha's Vayechi, the last Parsha of the book of Genesis, it says that Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, and he was 147 years old. And you look at Rashi, Rashi points out that usually there's a nine-space break between each Parsha. Finish a Parsha, you have the equivalent of nine spaces between that Parsha, and the, in, in a Torah scroll it is, between that Parsha and the one that comes after it. But there's one exception of the 53 breaks between the parshas. There's only one of them, but there's no break. There's no break. It's like a regular sentence that just continues. And that is between Parshas Vayigash, the second to last, the penultimate parsha of Genesis, and Parshas Vayichi, the final parsha of Genesis. Why is there no break, asks Rashi. Says Rashi, because this is the parsha that's going to talk about the passing of Jacob. And when he died... That's when the enslavement began. When did the Jewish people start suffering at the hands of Egypt? That was when the, with the passing of Jacob. And therefore, because it's such a sad time, it's such a closed up time, 
the verse is also closed up. There's no there's no empty break between the previous parsha and the successive parsha. Jacob arrived in Egypt at a certain point. Seventeen years later, he dies, and thus the nation is in total in the land of Egypt for 210 years, but they're only being enslaved, says Rashi, for that number, minus 17, so it's only 193 years. Okay, so now we have a fourth number. 430, 400, 210, and 193. Simple, clear, there's no questions. Right? Wrong. Exodus chapter 6, verse 16. We read about the lineage, the pedigree of Moses and Aaron, and it tells us that they have a grandfather and a great-grandfather, incidentally, whose name is Levi, the son of Jacob. And we're told these are the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kehas, and Merari. He had three sons. He had a daughter as well. And the life, the, the, the duration of the life of Levi was 137 years. So we're only told the length of life in, in, in Scripture of two of Jacob's 12 sons. The last verses of, of Genesis tell us that Joseph lived to be 110 and he passed. And now we read in the beginning of Exodus chapter 6, that Levi, he lived 137. Asked Rashi, why are we told the amount of years that Levi lived? To tell you how long the enslavement actually was. Because so long as one of the sons of Jacob was still alive, the Egyptians didn't actually enslave them. And who was the one who outlasted all his brothers? Who was the longest living member of Jacob's family? Well, that was Levi. And therefore, in order to be able to calculate how long the enslavement actually happened, we're told the length of life of Levi. And that's, we could calculate, okay, how long were they actually suffering in Egypt for? So now we get another number, fifth number. The death of Levi is also an important marker in this timeline. How long was the death of Levi? From the Exodus, 117 years. So we have 430, 400, 210, 193, death of Jacob, 117, the death of Levi. So the five answers to our question. How long were Jewish people in Egypt? How long were they suffering for? We have five answers so far. So I want to I ask the question already now. What is going on over here? Why are we given so many different answers to an apparently Simple question. How long were the Jews? Jews people were supposed to suffer in Egypt. They suffered, right? We have a whole edges, the whole book. Much of our religion is based upon this story. And we can't get a simple answer. How long were we there for? How long do we suffer for? What's the deal? Right now, we have five answers. What's happening here? What's the message? Why are there so many different times given to answer this question? So this is a question that I had for a long time. And then I found this book. Megala Amukos. The Revealer of the Depths. This is a book written by the rabbi of Krakow who lived 400 years ago. He passed away in 1633. I happen to be a direct descendant of him. He's a great sage, a giant, enormous sage. And he was a Kabbalist. And he was the one who had written a book with 252 different ways to explain one verse. And in fact, he was planning on writing a thousand, but the Almighty stopped him. After 252, that's it. You can't go any further. Only 252 interpretations of that. And by the way, the very first word of the book of Leviticus is the word Vayikra. And if you look at it in a Torah scroll, you'll see that the Aleph is small. It's a mini Aleph. He came up with a thousand different reasons why we have a small Aleph in Vayikra. I'm a, a scholar uh, beyond what we could fathom. I was perusing this book this past week. And I found the following essay. This is not exactly a very, very long essay. It's a page, maybe in a quarter. And the letters are fairly big. It's not like it's tiny. And he's going to help us navigate this subject. So the Megala Mukras tells us as follows. You thought there were five different answers to this question. Oh, no, no, no. There's actually 11 different answers to this question but they're not contradictory. The Egyptian experience, the Jewish people, the amount of time that they, that they lived in Egypt, they suffered at the hands of, the, uh, of Egypt, that whole experience, it was composed of 11 different parts. There were 11 different gradients of suffering, and each one of them had its own timeline. And here they are. The longest period 
was 430 years. That's from the time of the covenant of the parts until the Exodus. Meaning that at the point when the Almighty tells Abraham, you should surely know that your children will be a foreigner, will be aliens in a land that they don't own, and they'll be enslaved, and they'll be tormented for, for, for 400 years. From that point in history, something already changes. The nation is already a nation that's destined to suffer, and already at that point, even though they haven't started suffering, right now it's been concretized, it's been cemented that they're going to suffer, and right now they're already suffering because of the fact that they're going to suffer. So there's a slight influence, so to speak, of alienhood that descends upon the nation. It's the slightest of the 11 stages. Of course, it's going to get progressively harder as we go through the 11 stages, but this is going to be the one that lasts longest, 430 years. That's the first period. The second period begins 30 years later. 30 years later, we have the birth of Isaac. Isaac is the descendant of Abraham. And Abraham was told, you should know that your descendants will be foreigners of foreign lands, will be aliens, a land that they don't own. And they're going to suffer. They're going to be tormented. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to be oppressed. Abraham now has a descendant. So there's now another layer of the Egyptian experience that's descending upon the collective Jewish family. And that's going to last for 400 years from the birth of Isaac until the Exodus. And then we have a third number. This is the number 340. Isaac was 60 when his son Jacob was born. At that point, we go into the third dimension of exile, and here's where things get a little bit interesting. He quotes a verse in Job, chapter 22, verse 25, that that says, and God, using the name Shakai, will be with you in your suffering, and precious silver will be for you. That's the verse. God's going to be with you in your suffering, and then things are going to be okay. This is a reference, we're told. This is a hint at the Egyptian exile. And then he tells us the first two words, Vehaya Shakai, which is, by the way, also two names of God. If you count up the Gematria, it's 340. We're supposed to suffer for 340 years. And then we're going to leave with great wealth. Moreover, if you look at when Jacob finally descends to Egypt, you read the following verse. God tells him, I'm with you. I'm the God of your forefathers. Don't be scared of going to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation. Shum, over there. What's the numerical value of Shum? 340. This is the deep point over here. There was an element of the enslavement that was destined to be for 340 years. I say just tell us that Pharaoh had a dream associated with the number 130. And that's hinted in Genesis 45, 16, after Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. This message gets transmitted to Pharaoh. And the verse reads, V'hakol nishma beis paro. And the voice, the sound of this news was heard in the house of Pharaoh. He heard, he discovered that Joseph's brothers had arrived. And he was very happy. Not only him, his servants, his household as ministers. Here we're told the sentiments of Pharaoh when he discovered that Joseph's brothers are there. He was very happy. Not only he was happy, his people were happy. And if you look at the verse, you'll notice something very odd. The word kol, which means the sound or the voice of, normally it's spelled with a kuf and then a vav and then a lamid. Here it's spelled just a kuf and a lamid. It's, it's missing a letter. What is the numerical value of the word kol if it's divorced of its letter vav? Well, that's 130. Kuf is 100. Lamid is 30. Pharaoh's very happy and it's associated with the number 130. Okay, let's move to the next stage here. How much of this 340 block of suffering is done once Jacob arrives in Egypt? Well, if it begins with the birth of Jacob, how old was Jacob when he arrived in Egypt? Well, he's 130 years old. How do we know that? Because there's this very strange discussion of what happens when Pharaoh and Jacob meet. It's one of those very bizarre stories where apparently you have this small talk. They're talking about the weather. They're talking about sports. What do we talk about? This is Jacob, I mean Pharaoh. 
Well, if you read those verses, Genesis 47, 8 and 9, Pharaoh meets Jacob and he says to them, how old are you? Jacob must have looked really old. He asks, how old are you? And jo- Jacob responds, I'm 130. Thank you for asking. But he actually gives him a whole spiel. He tells him, well, the years of the days of my sojourns are 30 and 100 years, but they are very short and they are very bad. And the years of my life do not equal, do not match the years of my forefathers in their land. A very unusual discussion. What's happening over here? Very strange dialogue. Why does the Torah tell us of this small talk between Jacob and Pharaoh? Why does Jacob give this long-winded answer when a simple answer could have sufficed. How old are you? 130. Easy peasy. He gives this whole soliloquy at the, the years of the days of the life of his sojourn in his land. What is going on over here? We reveal here, again, the Medalamukas tells us that Pharaoh thought that the 340 timeline begins when Jacob arrives in Egypt. Not when Jacob was born. And therefore, there's going to be an additional 130 years tacked on to the end of the enslavement because the f- earlier years don't count. And this dream that Pharaoh has of 130 made him really happy. I'm going to have the Jewish people for another 130 years. What did Jacob tell him? No. The years of my life hitherto, well, that's part of the suffering. And he explains to them, these were years of Megurai. The word Megurai means my sojourns. But it's the same root of the word ger yezaracha. Your descendants will be foreigners. The years of my life are years of alienhood. They are years that are counting towards the 340. You're not going to have your extra 130 years after the Exodus time period is over. But Pharaoh persists. If you open up the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verse 10, Pharaoh is making his plot. Let us outsmart them. Let, let us deal shrewdly with the, with the Jews. Why? Maybe they will increase and there'll be a war and they'll join our enemies and they'll war, wage war with us and they'll leave the land. Galamukas points out the word pen, year, but perhaps they will increase in numbers. The word pen equals 130. What he's telling them, pen, year, but let's add those 130 years tack it on, appendage it to the amount of time that they think they're going to be here. He had this dream after all. He had this vision of 130 and he was pretty certain that this is going to portend that he's going to have another 130 years to be able to torment and enslave the Jewish people. But the truth is that Jacob was right. The 130 that he saw was not 130 years that he's going to have the Jewish people under his thumb. It was quite the contrary. It was the age of Yocheved when Moses was born. We know Yocheved, she was born right when Jacob entered the land. In fact, she was born, according to tradition, between the walls, right at this crossover moment between Jacob living in Canaan, Jacob being home, so to speak, and now the the family descending into Egypt, Right then she's born. Moses, we found out last year's parasha, was 80 years old at the time of the Exodus story. Ergo, if you have 210 years that the nation's there, and Moses is 80 when the Exodus happens, and his mother was born at the time when the enslavement began, 210 years prior, we know that his mother was 130 years old when he was born. And that's what Pharaoh really saw. But he misunderstood the message and he got the wrong takeaway, the wrong interpretation. The truth was he saw 130, but that's referring to his undoing, not about the years that he's going to add. Okay, so we have – right now we have three numbers, right? 430, 400, 340, and it's all part of this whole discussion. That discussion, that throwaway about the how old are you and, oh, I'm this, I'm 230 years old. There's now tons of context to it. There is this debate between Pharaoh and and Jacob as to how long the period of enslavement is going to be. Is it going to be an additional 130 years? That's what Pharaoh believes. And Jacob is like, no, we've already done that for 130 years before I arrived. We have a fourth number. And that's the number of 232. That's found in the Targum Yonas and Benuziel, one of the very early Mishnaic era translations of the Torah. 
he points out that Joseph arrives in Egypt 22 years before his father does. And consequently, 232 years before the Exodus, there is already a representative of the Jewish people, Joseph, he is already there. And that too is hinted in the text. When Abraham is told by God to take all the animals and cut them halfway, and each one of them will place, will place their half opposite the, the other ones, their, their fellows, meaning God's on one side and we're on the other side, so to speak, and we're making this pact together. He points out, the Galmukas does, that there's an acrostic. There's the first letter of three sequential words, Bisro, Lakras, Re'eyu, Abez, Alamed, and Arash equals 232. Already at the very beginning of God's plan, he's hinting there's going to be a component of the suffering that's only going to last for 232 years. And then we have the 210 number. And then we have the Midrash. Gives us a sixth number, 215, from the birth of Menashe. And in fact, that too is hinted in the original promise to Abraham. Yadoa teda, you should surely know, ki ger yihye zaracha, that your children will be foreigners. Ki ger yihye, the last letters of these three sequential words. Ki yihye zaracha, ten. 205 equal 215. And that's hinting at from when Joseph has a child, Menashe, it's 215 years later, that the exodus happened and there's a certain component, a certain dimension of the exile that's unlocked at that juncture and it's already hinted at the splitting of the parts. So how many dates do we have? We have a lot. Let's move on to number seven. 209 when Joseph appeals to his father, come down with me, rida, descend a lie. This is not ridu. Rida is only 209. Hurry back to me, descend. They'll be there for 209. It means they'll be there to- in total 210 years. But the last year, it's already the beginning of the Exodus doesn't count. And then we have, with the passing of Jacob was 193 years. And that's hinted in the third paragraph of the Shema. In the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 41, we read, Ani Hashem Elokechem. I am Hashem your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. To be for you for a God, I am Hashem your God. Ani Hashem Elokechem equals the number 193. To teach us that the Almighty had this whole planned out. And the suffering that we had in Egypt for 193 years, that element, that dimension of suffering, the Almighty was with us and the Almighty had it all planned out ahead of time. 54 years later, we have the death of Joseph. And this is 139 years prior to the Exodus. And the Midrash tells us that when Pharaoh appointed taskmasters over the Jewish people, when did that happen? That happened with the death of Joseph. And thus, there's another element, a ninth element of servitude that happened that was triggered with the death of Joseph 139 years before the Exodus. And then we have a 10th dimension, which was 117 years prior to the Exodus. And that was the actual time of the servitude that we had that began with the passing of Levi. And finally, the 11th dimension of the exile is 86 years prior to the Exodus, With the birth of Miriam, the elder sister of Moses, the word Miriam means mar. The word mar means bitter. This was a time of bitterness because that's when the highest and greatest and most intense servitude and suffering began was with the birth of Miriam. Moreover, 86 is a very important number. Because the word Elohim, the name of God that connotes judgment, equals 86. Going back to the original verse of, of Abraham. You should surely know that your children will be descendants, will, will be foreigners in a foreign land, and they will enslave them, and they will torment them for 400 years. The final letter of three sequential words, Va'avadum v'inu osam, equals 86. So again, 
what we're discovering here in the sources is that it's a much more complicated question. How long were the Jewish people suffering in Egypt? How long were they enslaved? We have 11 answers. 430 since the covenant. 400 since the birth of Isaac. 340 since the birth of Jacob. 232 since the descent of Joseph. 215 since the birth of Manasseh. 210 the time they spent in Egypt. 209 minus the years of the plagues. 193, 139, 117, the death of Jacob, Joseph, and Levi, respectively. And finally, 86, the birth of Miriam. What do we do with all this? So we discover something fascinating. What we discover is that these are not mutually exclusive. These are 11 progressively more intense suffering and subjugation, both of the physical and of the spiritual. And then he points out many other areas in Jewish literature and philosophy that relate to this 11 dimensions of suffering, 11 dimensions of spiritual deficiencies that we got because of our experience in Egypt. He tells us that we have Haman and his 10 sons. And that corresponds to these 11 dimensions of suffering that we had at the hands of the Egyptians. And that is a the template, so to speak, of all future sufferings. And he tells us that that the Satan, the Samach Mem, which is this destructive angel, he has 10 minions that he has with him, and they're trying to wreak havoc. And of course, we're fighting back. The Ketores, the Ketores is one of the most powerful services in the temple. It was comprised of 11 ingredients. You're coming at us with 11 forces towards the evil side, so to speak, towards sin, towards spiritual deficiencies. Haman and his 11 sons, the 11 gradients, the 11 components, the 11 parts of the Egyptian enslavement. We have the Ketoros with its 11 ingredients, and we have the 11 Psalms authored by Moses. In Egypt, as a result of these 11 dimensions of exile, the nation descended to a very dark, a very low place. Kabbalistically, we're told that there is 50 gates of holiness, and there's 50 gates of impurity. And the nation, right before the Exodus, because of these 11 dimensions of exile, of subjugation, they were on the doorstep of the 50 gates of impurity. If they were to cross over that threshold, they would be condemned to eternal destruction. How many times does scripture reference the Exodus? It's a question most of us don't know by heart. But the answer is 61 times. Why does it mention the Exodus 61 times? Because the nation was drowning in 61 different spiritual maladies. You have the 50 gates of impurity, and you have the 11 dimensions of exile, and that's why there's 61 components that we have to try to get out of. The 61 blockades between us and God that we're trying to bash through via the Exodus. But what happens with the Exodus? What happens afterwards? At the moment of the Exodus, the nation is temporarily lifted to the highest place. From the 50 gates of impurity, right away we're brought to the absolute zenith, the 50 gates of holiness. But we really didn't earn that. And we had to actually earn it ourselves. So after the Exodus, we are once again flatlined, And now over the course of the next 50 days, each day we're unlocking another gate of holiness and freeing ourselves from a gate of impurity. And after 50 days of transformation, the nation is ready for Sinai. Actually, no. They're still somewhat flawed. Yes, they got rid of the 50 gates of impurity. Yes, they've climbed, they've ascended the mountain so to speak, of the 50 gates of holiness, but their net deficiency was not just 50, it was 61. It was the 50 gates of impurity plus the 11 dimensions of exile. And therefore, even after Sinai, there was still something missing. What do we have? We have a nation, despite achieving the highest level, despite witnessing things that we can't even fathom at Sinai, despite a nation being 
uplifted, where they actually earn the level of prophecy, because now they're at 50 levels of, of holiness, there's still 11 dimensions of exile. There's still a little bit of the venom of Egypt quivering within them. What happens? 40 days later, Moshe arrives and he discovers them doing the golden calf. And then he just tells us this was 11 days from Chorev. For 29 days, they're with God. For 11 days, they're contemplating the sin of the golden calf. There is still a little bit of the Egyptian experience within them. They spent a long time, 430 years, depends how you count, in Egypt, surrounded by idolatry. And that influence has not been removed. And therefore, the 11 days, i.e. the 11 vestigial spiritual deficiencies are still there, are still left over from Egypt. And therefore, they still have something within them. They still have some corrosion, some deficiencies within them that could be manifested by the sin of the golden calf 40 days later, really 11 days of contemplation, 11 of the dimensions of exile, 11 of the components of the influence of Egypt are still harboring within them. You know, the Egyptian experience, what we underwent, that is the foundation of our, of our nation. That's the foundation of our religion. Here we see an insight as to what that means. It's not just, oh, we were not allowed to uh, engage in free commerce. We we were forced to work. Oh, oh, but God came and freed us from that. Ain't that lovely? There are dimensions of subjugation and submission to a different way of life that is not only different but contradictory to what Abraham began, to what our nation really stands by. And our job, not just at the Exodus, but really – the Exodus and the Egyptian enslavement are a template for Jewish history. We're subjugated, and then we have to try to extricate ourselves with the help of the Almighty. But that's a template for all the Jewish experience that comes afterwards. Today, we don't have Pharaoh. Today, we don't have the subjugation of Egypt. Thank God. But we still believe that there are at least 11 components of the influence, of the spiritual influence of the suffering that happened with Egypt, we're still waiting for our own exodus. We're still waiting to free ourselves of that. As we mentioned in the past, the idea of a foreign God having dominion over us, of course, we have that in the physical, tangible, visceral sense with Pharaoh, but the Talmud tells us, Within each and every one of us, there is a foreign God who says, the Almighty, God, creator of heaven and earth, is not in charge. I'm in charge. My name is the Yetzirah Saharan. You obey my orders. And by default, his dominion is total. And just like we were subjugated to Pharaoh with 11 different ways, 11 different ropes of servitude, we too are subjected to the Yetzirah in a multiple of ways. And the Exodus is teaching us, is encouraging us, it's coaching us that we can once again free ourselves. We can become people who are worthy of Torah, who are worthy of ascending the mountain of God, who have cleared ourselves away of all the problematic and harmful and injurious and deleterious influences of the eight Sarai and all the foreign gods and truly submit ourselves to the Almighty and accept his dominion and entrench his dominion over us in total. May we all be so fortunate to achieve our own personal exodus and to free ourselves from all the things, from all the inhibitors and blockades and obstacles preventing us from connecting to our essence, to our soul, and of course, to the Almighty. My email address is rabbiwobajima.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, any questions or comments or feedback of any kind is always welcome.